And Thank you. for our second speakers, uh, Professor Dr. Michael Papasokru, he is a chair of the Computer Science and Executive Director of the European Research Institute for Service Science, University of Tilburg, the Netherlands. He is also an honorary professor at many universities. He also acts as an advisor to the European Commissioner in the matter relating to the Internet of Service and as an advisor and reviewer of a national research program for numerous countries. Professor Michael's research interest lies in the area of service science, service-oriented computing, web services, web, enge web engineering, large-scale data sharing, cloud computing, and distributed computer systems. He also published over 200 journals and peer-reviewed international conference paper and authors and co-edited uh, 23 books. Uh, his talk today will be on research roadmap for service-oriented co computing. This is a challenge. My services don't seem to be working. <laughs> I have no idea. Ah, brilliant. It was the resolution, actually. Usual problem. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm really pleased to be here with you uh, to present my views and ideas about uh, services. Uh, actually, this is a challenge after uh, listening to the talk of uh, Ian. Uh, he did an excellent job of presenting services and in particular giving a lot of examples about services. So in many respects, it makes my life very easy and very difficult because I uh, actually have uh, now uh, of course, a reference point, uh, which is Ian's presentation, and I have to uh, bring, elevate my presentation to his level. So, uh, without uh, further ado, let me uh, present to you uh, the outline of my talk. And in particular, what I want to do is to give you a rather broad talk uh, today. Uh, actually, I'm talking about a research roadmap here, which is in reality is not a research roadmap because basically what I did is I changed uh, my presentation uh, halfway through after looking at the program that uh, Tavida was uh, very kind to provide me with. And I used a lot of examples from the area of smart services. So my talk is actually half an introductory talk and another half is probably using examples from smart uh, from the smart service domain and in particular healthcare services and show you what research activities are, uh, let's say, important in these uh, domains and how we can go about them. Uh, at any case, if we look at the, uh, my, the talk, my outline here, you're going to have a, an overview here, which is a rather broad overview, uh, a vision and an aim. And then I'm going to give you some examples, especially examples from the area of smart services, like, like I said before. Uh, then I will concentrate on services and software uh, and software architectures, or if you wish, uh, service-oriented architectures. Uh, my talk is rather technical, so in a sense, I am very much interested in uh, software services or automated services, if you wish, uh, which ties in very nicely with what Ian mentioned before, because he was looking at the problems from the business point of view, from the economics, from the innovation point of view, whereas I'm looking more from the technical point of view. How do we take business services and how do we translate those services into technologies and what technologies are out there and what do these technologies do with uh, those services and how do we solve problems, practical problems, that is. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
And uh, in particular, I'm interested in services in the cloud. So basically, my, uh, if you wish, my talk is a two-pronged talk. Uh, firstly, I'm going to talk about services in general, and then I'm going to talk about cloud services. So I'm going to bring the world of services, and if you wish, web services together with cloud services. And I'm going to present to you a research roadmap. So uh, let me uh, talk to you about what I'm going to present and what knowledge I expect from your side. Uh, so in a sense uh, here, I do expect that you have some understanding of the cloud and of services, general understanding of the cloud and of services, and in particular, uh, you understand a little bit about business processes, and this is uh, where uh, I stop. Now, let us uh, start with the overview. Well, what I'm interested in here is smart applications, and, and uh, Ian mentioned quite a lot of those applications in his talk. Uh, so in a sense, there's, there's a lot of applications which we have out there which we call smart services. And the range, for example, from smart food systems down to the level of smart cities, smart telephony, um, water management, and the like. And what happens here is we're interested in more, uh, let's say, in a wealth of information. We're interested in analyzing information and knowledge. And this is where these KBIs of Ian are very important here. So we have a large number of services. And what we want to do is we want to understand how these services perform, uh, what operations uh, they provide us with, uh, who they service, and so on. And uh, the entire contextual environment in which the services operate so that we can bundle them together with other like services to create value-added value solutions. And in particular, we're interested here in better decision-making. Uh, so knowledge is very, very important here. Uh, so we're interested in smarter service and cloud technologies, uh, which are very central to this problem. And in other words, we want to deploy not only services, but also resources and devices here. So the word service in my vocabulary means a lot of things. Uh, it means uh, not only software services, it means resources like computing resources, it means devices like mobile devices, but it also means humans. So human operators are services themselves, are part of the service ecosystem. So you cannot have an, a service ecosystem without having a human operator somewhere in this particular context. And I will come to that a little bit later on. So let us look first of all at what we call uh, smart services and uh, service-oriented architectures. Uh, smart services are modular services, if you wish, or modular components which are standardized and they're easily, within inverted commas, integratable with little effort with like services to produce value-added propositions. So basically, I'm very much interested here in orchestrating services, and this is something that uh, Ian mentioned that is of uh, huge importance to organizations. So basically, the idea is we want to create a network of uh, service providers who can collaborate and deliver services to their mutual benefit, but also to the benefit of a customer. Now, uh, these services are improving decision making. And in particular, we're talking about services which can tune themselves. They can improve their performance, for example, by learning, within inverted commas, of course. So they use, for example, uh, all kinds of uh, computing learning techniques, if you wish, in order to improve the performance, in order to be able to orchestrate better with other services, in order to uh, use uh, existing resources, and in particular, in order to improve their performance and all kinds of key performance indicators which are associated with them. So services traditionally have uh, key performance indicators associated with them, and these key performance indicators could be anything ranging from security, for example, privacy, down to the level of how fast these uh, services are, of course, being performed and uh, what types of delivery times we are talking about here. Uh, let us look at something which we call a service uh, oriented architecture. Now, uh, the word architecture here is uh, a misnomer. So there's nothing about architecture in SOA. 
So SOA is a, is a model, if you wish, a logical model, if you wish, or a conceptual model which tells you how you can deliver services and how you consume services. So there's nothing about an architecture there. It's a very, very simple, uh, let's say, way of describing services. So these services are equivalent, if you wish, to Lego blocks. I provide you with a service, you take the service, you use it in your organization, but maybe you integrate your, my service with somebody else's service in order to create a much more complicated, much more complex value-adding service, for example, which you can sell to your customers. So basically here we have three operations. First of all, you declare what services you provide to your customers. Uh, your customers search for those services. Once they find those services, they use them in their own context and maybe they compose them with other services. So this is a very, very simple, uh, let's say, model, which has nothing, of course, to do with architectures. Uh, so basically, at the end of the day, we want to perform a specific business task. Uh, for example, we gather real-time traffic into uh, less congested routes or to try and, and we advise drivers and so on uh, so that we can, uh, let's say, uh, improve the traffic uh, situation in, in congested cities like Bangkok or whatever. So basically here at the end of the day we are talking about services which are processes. So our, our services are quite complex processes, and this is exactly what also Ian mentioned many times in his presentation, that we're talking about uh, service-like uh, processes. And basically, these processes can be composed into more, let's say, value-adding propositions by being integrated with other like services. And I'm going to give you some examples later on. Uh, so, for example, here, if we start integrating different traffic uh, services, we can come up with integrated traffic networks uh, and that allow people to make connections easily and take the fastest route or the most economic uh, route possible. And also, for example, in cases that there is traffic congestion, they can take an alternative route. So all these services can be combined as long as they're uh, they are addressing the same type of problem, or they fall under the same domain, of course. Okay, so if we're talking about technical services and software services in particular, uh, the first thing that comes into mind is that we have to have something which we call a reference architecture or a reference model. And this is where we start from. And this is what I'm going to explain to you now. So basically, we start from something which we call here uh, the problem domain or the business domain, if you wish. And let's assume that we talk about a domain which is distribution. Distribution and logistics are very simple and people understand them fairly well. So let us look at the domain which is called distribution. So what do we do? How do we describe this domain by means of services? Let's say, for example. Oops. This particular domain is split into a number of standardized processes. So as you see here, you have, uh, for example, purchasing processes, you have order management processes, and you have inventory processes. So basically what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to design or engineer my services. So I'm looking at my, at my domain, I try to identify the processes which are important in this domain, and I'm trying to decompose my domain into a number of processes. And here what I did is, of course, I decomposed my domain into three relatively simple processes. In reality, this exercise is much more complicated. Now, if I start looking at these processes, I'm going to understand that these processes involve a number of services or business services, if you wish. If I concentrate on the order management process, I'm going to see that the order management process involves a number of activities. It has activities like creating, modifying, for example, suspending, uh, or canceling orders, scheduling orders, uh, creating and modifying uh, 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 bulk orders, and so on. So all these kinds of services contribute to this process, which I call an order management process. By the same token, uh, I could do the composition of the other two processes, which I have on this slide. Of course, it, uh, there's not enough space to, uh, let's say, decompose the other two processes, but the principles are very much the same. So what I'm doing here is I'm doing a top-down decomposition. I'm starting, I'm starting with something which is very abstract, and I am gradually putting more and more information into my domain and into my processes. Yeah. 
and I am gradually putting more and more information into my domain and into my processes. Now, what I've done so far is I've given you a logical view of my services. So I claim I'm doing design here and I'm giving you a, log a logical view of the problem that I'm going to solve. I didn't tell you anything about the implementation of these services, who is providing these services, how these services are implemented, uh, whether they are implemented in a programming language, in, in um, let's say, a Windows environment, in a Unix environment, uh, they run on powerful machines or, uh, on, on, or let's say portable computers or mobile computers or what have you. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm doing logical design. Now, the next step, of course, is to start thinking about how I'm going to implement these services. So these services are virtual services. I'm defining those services, I'm giving you enough information so that you can implement those services, and I'm saying to you, by the way, look, there might be some of those services already implemented out there, so start looking where these services are implemented and try to reuse them. So in other words, reusability is something which is very, very important here. So here we have a number of infrastructure services which start implementing those virtual services which I have on the top. So my business services and my business processes, they're implemented by infrastructure services. So these are very technical services, if you wish. And this is uh, incidentally referred to as component implementations, if you wish, of those services. So these components are actual pieces of software which implement those services. Now I have different options. I can reuse already existing implementation. I can insource, let's say, implementation from other providers, or I can partially insource the implementation from other providers and develop new implementations in my own organization. But the truth of the matter is that there's a number of resources out there, there are operational systems which I can reuse in the context of my, let's say, reference architecture in order to be able uh, to implement those services. So basically what I am doing here is I am do doing a physical design, if you wish. So we have a conceptual design, a logical view, if you wish, followed by a physical view. And at the end of the day, these views meet in the middle. So basically, the trick is, what you're going to do is you're going to look at process composition or decomposition depending on which way you look at your services. If you look from the top to the bottom, you're doing decomposition. If you look from the bottom to the top, you're doing composition. But the truth of the matter is you have to meet somewhere in the middle so that your design, of course, and your reference models are correct. So basically, this is a reference model which I will use uh, for the next uh, few slides, and I'm going to explain to you how we go about implementing those services or composing those services and what the open problems, of course, are there. And if you start... Uh, actually designing your services, you, you have a lot of uh, open questions which you want uh, to have answered before you start implementing them. For example, one of the biggest problems that we are facing with services, and this might uh, seem to you that this is something very trivial, is the granularity of a service. How thin or how thick a service is. This makes a big difference. So if I, for example, my organization, I choose to, uh, for example, have, uh, let's say, very, uh, let's say, coarse services, and you, you choose to use fine-grained services, then we have a problem. We have an interoperability problem. So we need to agree on conventions, we need to agree on standards, and among those standards, we need also to agree on the granularity of the services. And this is something very important, because if you don't uh, solve these problems from the very beginning, you're not going to have, of course, at the end of the day, a proper implementation of your services. So granularity is one of the biggest problems, and a lot of people and organizations tend to underestimate the granularity of the service. Of course, there are other, uh, let's say, uh, questions here that we need to, to look at how we compose services, how we decompose services, how do we relate services to resources, uh, how do we deal with non-functional, uh, let's say, requirements like security, privacy, transactionality, and the like. And I'm going to mention a few of those problems a little bit later on. Now, the crux of services here, or technical services if you wish, software services are business processes. 
And basically, the focus of my talk is on business processes. Uh, so business process is very much a service. Of course, this is an automated service. And of course, it's a catalyst for collaboration, if you wish, or orchestration. So I can have different kinds of processes, like you see here, which come from maybe from different organizations. And of course, I can have requests and responses, and I can have interfaces. And in particular, my processes deal with three, uh, let's say, pillars, if you wish, or three elements. They deal with data. They deal with persons, so a person or a, an actor is responsible for driving or executing a process, and of course they deal with applications. So these processes are quite powerful instruments, and of course driving implementations at the end of the day. So let us look at uh, services in the cloud. Now, basically this is the example that I used before, and this example of, uh, let's say, logistics or, or uh, let's say, transportation processes, if you wish, is being ported onto the cloud. And here you see we have purchasing, we have order management, we have in inventory, and we have all kinds of billing and, and financial, let's say, services which are ported onto the cloud. It here it means that I have different kinds of providers who may live on the cloud and provide the different kinds of services that I want to import and I want to use in my own context so that you can create more powerful applications. Now, of course, at the end of the day, what I do here is I create end-to-end -end processes. And this is a big ask. This assumes that we have, of course, standard definitions. We have standard processes, so we understand each other's processes. So these processes are very much standardized in terms of what they, uh, uh, the activities that they, of course, perform, what they offer as input, as output, and, of course, their terminology. So these are uh, issues which have been resolved before you start integrating different kinds of processes. So. And at the end of the day, what you do have here is in the middle of the composition of your services or the orchestration, you have human operators who make sure that the, uh, let's say, composition of your service or the orchestration of your service into a larger service is something which is executed correctly. So basically, uh, if we look at what happened in the research literature, there's a lot of people who claim that services, for example, in computer science or in, in, in software engineering, uh, services are automatically composed into larger orchestrations. This is very, very wrong, unless we're talking about, about very small and very, very precise, let's say, compositions of services. If we go into larger domains and complicated domains, you cannot achieve anything automatically unless you have at the end of the day a human operator who oversees the composition and make sure that this composition is performing correctly. Now, if we look at the cloud, we're going to see that the cloud is, of course, another model. It's a consumption model. And of course, it is also a delivery model. And basically, what we talk about here is resource, uh, different kinds of resources which can be offered by different kinds of providers here. And in particular, we can configure infrastructures. And of course, here, when we talk about infrastructure, we talk also about highly virtualized infrastructure. And we're talking about different kinds of sourcing options and economies of scale. So reusability, again, here is a word which is very, very important for both services and the cloud. And we have multiple types of clouds, private, public, and of course we have uh, hybrid clouds which stand between, let's say, public and private clouds. And of course, at the end of the day, what we want to do, since cloud provides us with a number of services, and of course we have services which come from the business trajectory, what we want to do, we want to have a uniform way of representing those services and using those services. Now, if you start looking at the cloud, you're going to understand that the cloud provides you with more technical or implementation services. So these are the mostly the physical services that I talked to you about in my reference architecture. So in other words, we have services which we describe, and we try to find an infrastructure on which those services can run. Well, the infrastructure comes from the cloud, and this is why cloud services are rather important. Now, if I look at the cloud, it's been divided into three broad, uh, let's say, types of services. The software as a service, the platform as a service, and the infrastructure as a service. And basically, what I have done in my reference architecture is I talked about the logical design or the logical view, which is software as a service. Then I talked to you about the physical view, 
which is the platform as a service. In other words, your middleware, your databases, and all kinds of uh, service which you have here to support middleware service, to support your applications. And finally, you have the infrastructure as a service, which is part of the physical design, if you wish. And here we are talking about storage and bare bone, uh, let's say, machines which support the middleware or the applications as a service, or software as a service, if you wish. Now, if we look at the research roadmap, then basically what we want to do here is we want to look at uh, smart service networks, and in particular, we want to look at smart applications, and we want to look at architectures and core technologies, which follows very much the same trajectory as I explained to you before. Now, here we, we are looking at something which uh, is a long-term research objective, at least insofar as technical services or software services are concerned, and we're talking about something which I call, I call smart service networks, and not only me, but a lot of people, of course. And these are working on federated cloud environments. In other words, they try to organize and, if you wish, orchestrate a large number of cloud services from private providers, from public providers, and create federated cloud environments. Uh, they are characterized by openness, by agility, by scalability, uh, uncertain performance, and uncertain processes. So basically, it means that if I run the same application today, I may get different results today than the results that I'm going to get tomorrow, simply because I'm getting different kinds of resources and different kinds of operators which support, let's say, my processes. And I'm talking here about processes which are, of course, uh, let's say, non-safety critical processes. If they are safety critical processes, then, of course, you have to handle them in a completely different way. Uh, they're characterized by evolvability and adaptability, if you wish. Our services evolve, they change with the passage of time, they're getting customized, they're getting uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, agile. So in that case, my services have to perform better and better depending, of course, on, uh, let's say, their clientele and, and the, the performance requirements. Uh, we, we're talking about demand rather than supply-driven processes. In other words, I have to pose a problem that needs to be solved rather than fi the finding a solution which is out there. And this is something that Keith alluded to. Uh, we cannot have standardized solutions. Basically, what you have, you have particular solutions. If you wish specialized solutions or customizable solutions, and what you want to do is you want to go out there and find the services which can service your particular problem and cannot provide you with the best solution and most economic solution possible. Uh, so here what you do is you combine big data, associated processes, and also you have something which has not been uh, discussed very much uh, these days. This is big analytics. So basically you want to be able to predict. In other words, you're going to predict how you're going to solve a problem on the basis of the services that you have, the business services that is, the business processes, and on the resources which are available. And you're going to try and solve this problem as optimally as possible. So, and at the end of the day, you want to do a lot of design, but design is not a one-off design, it's a change-oriented design. So here we have another, uh, let's say if you wish, uh, tenant, which is a change-oriented design, which means that if I design my services, I have to make sure that these services are going to evolve in the future. I cannot provide you with a basic monolithic solution which is not going to change later on. If I do that, and if I invest a lot of work in my design uh, a priori before I start seeing how my services work or perform, if you wish, in practice, then I'm doing something wrong. I need to provide you with opportunities so that you can evolve your services. Now, what we did here is a few years back, uh, we organized uh, research in terms of an extended uh, uh, service-oriented architecture, and in this architecture you see here uh, we extend the basic uh, uh, service-oriented architecture, which is at the bottom of this pyramid, uh, with uh, two more layers, or actually three layers. Uh, the, uh, the base of the pyramid here is concentrating on basic functionality, 
And this functionality is concentrating on describing the services on and on, of course, uh, discovering the appropriate services and binding to the appropriate services, which is the traditional uh, service-oriented architecture. On top of that, we have uh, a layer which is called composition, which tries to compose different kinds of services. And at the, the top of the pyramid, you have the management and monitoring plane. So management and monitoring means that when my services, my orchestrations, in other words, the compositions of my services start running, I need to be able to monitor them to find out whether they're operating uh, according, let, let's say, to their specifications. If they are not, then I need to manage them in such a way so that they always perform under let's say, uh, for example, my service level agreements and they deliver the right type of performance or the right type of security. And at the end of the day, the whole pyramid is surrounded with what I mentioned here as design and development methodology. So this is where I'm doing design. So design is pervasive and design has to do with all aspects of services, be it on the definition of services, the orchestration of services, or on the management of services. In other words, my KBIs are here the methodology for designing services. So all the knowledge that services have to offer, they are absorbed, if you wish, by my design methodologies so that I can design and deliver appropriate solutions for my services. Now, each of these areas has specific requirements. I'm not going to talk too much about these requirements. I'm going to rush you through some, some of uh, the slides. And basically what I did here is I described these four areas, uh, which are the service foundations. Uh, these are the traditional SOA or service-oriented architecture plane. On top of that, we have the composition or assembly of services, service management and monitoring, and the service development lifecycle or service engineering. There is something which is also important, uh, which uh, these are cross-cutting concerns, and they cut through all these layers. And these concerns are quality of service, semantics, in other words, the definitions of services, the standards which uh, underlie the services and the processes, non-functional characteristics like security, privacy, performance, and of course, policies which uh, drive those services. Now, if uh, we look at service foundations, we have typical challenges here. We have a lot of open problems. And of course, uh, ideally, I should go through all these four planes and explain to you the open problems, but of, of course, I don't have enough time. So I'm going to give you a glimpse of the problems that we have and the, the, the challenges, the research challenges that we have. And one of the most important uh, challenges is to, to find the right type of implementations for my services. And I mentioned to you repeatedly that cloud services are something which provide you with an implementation platform for the business services. So this is where the cloud comes in. So the architecture or the, the infrastructural architecture is very much based on the cloud. Uh, a lot of people today mentioned about the enterprise service bus. An enterprise service bus is an infrastructure which implements services, but in a very centralized way, and is very cumbersome. If you start looking at the cloud, you have enormous possibilities. Of course, you reuse resources, and, and you have much more flexibility. But of course, you don't have standardized solutions like the, in the same way that you can achieve them with an enterprise service bus. So basically, you have here something which I call dynamically reconfigurable runtime architectures. So in other words, the requirements of your architecture need to be re-evaluated at runtime. So every time that I run my services, the circumstances may have changed. I may demand better accuracy, better performance, uh, and of course, more economical services. So this means that I am imposing continuously new requirements on my architecture, and this architecture needs to evolve with time. And these are open research problems. There's a lot of interest in those particular topics. And this has been gathered by observing most of the papers, the research papers, and the open calls for, uh, let's say, conferences on, of course, software services and automated services. And uh, one last point here is demand-driven creation and evolution of smart service networks. How do I create a smart service on demand? For example, how do I choose the right partners 
in order to be able to provide you with a solution and how do I deliver the right type of performance and the right type of service level agreements that I have already put in place when I was initially discussing or agreeing, uh, let's say, or negotiating, if you wish, a contract with the customer. Now, service composition, this is uh, a minefield insofar as research goes. There's enormous open problems. There's a wealth of open problems here that we can look at. And uh, in particular, these days, people are looking at dynamic compositions, in other words, compositions which change with the passage of time uh, into modularizing and parameterizing compositions. So in other words, you need to structure your compositions in such a way so that you can, modularize, you can parameterize them and reuse them. Uh, and of course, you look at analysis of business processes, of protocols, and all kinds of planning techniques in order to be able uh, to have a more creative uh, solution to the problem of service composition. And these are uh, very much uh, open research problems, and there's a lot of work happening in these areas. Uh, if you look at carefully at what happens in research, you're going to find out that there is only sporadic references to uh, concepts or, if you want, issues like uh, the evolution of services, the adaptation of services, and the versioning of services, or business processes, if you wish. So these are very much open problems, and of course, they, de they demand a lot of creative uh, solutions by means of uh, research. Uh, the other thing is uh, something that Ian already mentioned. Uh, this has to do with the legal requirements and regulatory requirements. So how do we describe and associate data and constraints with business processes? So there's a lot of regulatory requirements in, insofar as environmental services are concerned or logistic services and so on, which need to somehow be associated with our processes and services and they need to be composed in the right way so that the solutions that we offer make sense from a legal point of view. And these are extremely complicated problems and of course they demand solutions. We do have some mathematical problems, but yet we're very far yet from providing, let's say, holistic solutions. Okay, so uh, let me move into something which I call a medical uh, cloud. Um, there are some issues here about the composition, the autonomic composition of services, uh, how we can find uh, self-configuring compositions of services, self-adjusting and so on. These are dynamic aspects of services and service composition that I mentioned to you before. And some of those things have already been presented by Ian in a completely different context, of course. So let me move now to uh, the second part of my discussion. And this is, these are examples from the medical cloud. And I want to give you some precise ideas of how we go about, uh, let's say, representing services and associating services, uh, business services with, uh, let's say, infrastructure and cloud services. Uh, the problems that I have here, they come from the uh, medical domain, and uh, there's a medical cloud uh, project that we have embarked on uh, recently, and what we want to do is we want to provide a better integrated medical world. And here, basically, we are talking about aggregation of clinical information, uh, about all kinds of uh, repositories and patient history, if you wish, uh, allergies, uh, radiograms, uh, ECGs, and the like. And of course, you want also to look at, uh, let's say, um, the personnel which is involved with the treatment of a patient, like the doctors, the patients, the hospitals, the medical diagnosis centers, the devices, which can be patient embedded devices, for example, connected laboratories, and so on. So you have a huge network of services here, uh, which not only encompass, let's say, technical solutions, but also experts, and of course, all kinds of other, let's say, resources, which we need to interconnect in a meaningful way. So here we have a patient, as you see, and uh, a patient has uh, got, uh, let's say, devices, um, mobile devices embedded on him. And these devices, maybe they measure uh, blood pressure or the sugar levels, and they transmit this information to a central location. Uh, with, and a doctor who is treating this patient is observing, uh, let's say, how the patient uh, progresses. Now, smartness in this context is gaining real-time 
let's say, line of sight. In other words, understanding the problem and trying to optimize the use of resources in order to be able to plan and coordinate them to solve this particular problem. So if my patient, for example, has uh, high blood uh, sugar levels, then maybe this patient needs to be moved to the hospital and maybe he needs to be operated on or he needs to be given a particular therapy. So basically, the more knowledge I have about my patient and about the symptoms of the disease that my patient is facing, uh, the better the solution will be eventually for this particular patient because I can cure him or her, of course. Now, so we're shifting towards more proactive and more predictive medicine. And in particular, what we want to do here is we want to have a concept of smart patient-centric healthcare. And basically, I want to gather all types of information and knowledge from all the sources wherever it may exist. Because this patient, maybe he uh, is moving around the country, for example. He lived in different cities or in different locations. He visited different hospitals or he was attended to by different, uh, let's say, doctors or medical professionals. And at the end of the day, this patient may have, uh, let's say, a lot of information which is completely dispersed around the country or, for example, Europe or throughout Asia or whatever. So at the end of the day, you want to collect all this knowledge and, of course, try to analyze this knowledge to find out what the symptoms are, what your patient is suffering from, and, of course, try to cure the patient because the patient may have a number of allergies that you're not aware of if you take him to the hospital or take her to the hospital and you want to operate on them. So we're talking about integrated medical services. So these are uh, cloud applications uh, which, uh, uh, let's say, integrate an enormous amount of data and processes which might be scattered throughout a number, let's say, of hospitals or medical laboratories, if you wish. Uh, as an example here, uh, I have an example which comes from the NHS in the UK. Uh, this example comes from uh, uh, the smart uh, management cloud that we're working together with uh, the uh, Cambridge uh, University hospitals. Uh, and this uh, particular chart here shows you that there's a number of hospitals which are integrated somehow uh, at the uh, eastern part of uh, the UK, East Anglia in particular. And uh, these are emergency departments and hospitals where, uh, for example, we can take a patient depending on the, on the symptoms that this particular patient has. And in particular, we're interested here in, in, in an integrated medical environment which uh, del tries to deliver more personalized uh, services to the uh, patient, of course. So if I know what the symptoms of the patient are and, and what his history or her history is, then I will take this patient to the appropriate, uh, let's say, hospital, no matter if uh, this patient happens to live close to one of the hospitals in the region. So basically, all these hospitals, uh, they try to integrate their resources, they try to integrate their expertise, and they try to integrate the services and share them so that they can be, uh, let's say, of more value to uh, at least uh, the health care system in this particular, uh, let's say, region. So let me give you, let me skip this slide because it's not that interesting, and let me give you an example of what we are working on. We're working on a, mod, on a model for, let's say, medical services, which we call a five by five model. So if you look at this model at the left-hand side of the picture, you're going to find that we have stakeholders. Uh, I need to, I guess, go here because I cannot see it. Uh, so you have uh, patient care devices and equipment. So this is specialized equipment that you have to use in order to cure a patient. Uh, you have me medical records and tests. You have the medication that the patient is taking, and you have medical process segments. And these are the processes that you are using in order to cure the patient. On the right-hand side, you have capacity, schedules, flows, and safety and performance. So on the left-hand side, you have the resources that you're using in order to cure a patient. On the right-hand side, you have, uh, let's say, uh, schedules and, of course, uh, capacities and flows. So capacity is what is available for, for the cure of a patient. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is patient symptoms cure. So here is what is needed to cure the patient. In other words, what type of medication do we need? What type of expert do we need to operate on the patient, for example? The safety procedures, because there's a lot of safety procedures and a lot of legal issues associated, of course, with medical services. Uh, and there you have a medical schedule and workflow. So this is the medical process 
which tells you how we're going to cure the patients, what we're going to cure, and what resources we're going to use, and when we're going to use them. And finally, you have a treatment performance which tells you how the patient was treated, uh, what was achieved, and resources which are actually used. So these you can store, of course, in a storage, uh, in a safe storage, and you can retrieve those types of solutions in order to be able to perform better next time that you have a patient with the same, for example, symptoms. Now, if you look at those situations, you have a lot of requirements which come from the business level and from the infrastructure level. And let me give you some examples here very quickly. Uh, so here is, these are the stakeholders. So we, ca we have come up with a solution which encompasses this five by five model, which we call it a medical blueprint. So a medical blueprint tries to associate all resources and all schedules and all processes together and to create a holistic solution for, let's say, curing a particular patient. And it gathers all the information together. And this information is not only processes, is data, is timing constraint, is all kinds of, let's say, safety constraints, and all kinds of human, uh, let's say, resources which are involved in the cure or the operation of a patient, let's say. So here, for example, some of the actors, if you wish, or the stakeholders are health providers, healthcare providers. Uh, you have laboratories, you have public health staff, and of course, at the end of the day, your consumer or your client here is your patient. And all this information is being recorded. So you record this information and you associate this information with a particular patient. So this is like a cookie cutter, if you wish, which you instantiate and you give it information in order to know which hospitals, which laboratories the patient has visited, which are the uh, doctors who are treating this particular patient, and what kind of resources were used. Now, the next thing is the medical uh, processes or the bl uh, blueprints which deal with workflow. And as you see here, we have a patient who suffers from diabetes, and you have a process which tells you exactly how are you going to treat diabetes? It starts by telling you uh, that you, of course, bring the, the patient to the, the hospital, and it starts telling you is a prescriptive process and is a very standardized process, which gives you the precise steps that you have to undertake in order to be able to cure a patient who has an acute case of diabetes. And of course, it tells you what types of results you have to have, what types of standards you have to follow, and all the procedures, the medical procedures that you have to have in place in order to cure this particular patient. And of course, this is again automated, and it's connected to the previous blueprint that I mentioned to you, which is the stakeholders. So slowly you start creating an entire solution, a personalized solution for a patient. And this is very much an open research problem on which we are working at the moment with a number of uh, partners. Now, let us move to the cloud, and let me explain to you how the cloud works in the case of medical services. So let us assume that we are dealing here with patients who have, let's say, a lot of requirements in terms of, uh, let's say, <clears throat> the uh, infrastructure that they are using. So let's assume that uh, you have here a, a lot of MRI files for a particular patient, and you want to study those MRI files, and you want to associate them with one another. Now, MRI files create huge requirements in terms of space, in terms of memory. So if you see here, uh, if you have a multi-slice cardiac files for a particular patient, you need something like 500 megabytes. And of course, if you start, uh, let's say, dealing with uh, large numbers of patients and of course, uh, large numbers of MRI scans and multi-slice uh, slice cardiac files, then you create much more intensive, uh, let's say, requirements for memory capacity. So your memory capacity here is immense. Now, and you need, of course, network requirements. You need very high speed networks and reliable transportation. So in medicine, everything happens in real time. So of course, you need to have 
to transfer information in, in milliseconds, and of course everything happens in real time. And these images have to move from one, let's say, uh, location to another, maybe from a laboratory to the hospital in real time so that the patient is treated properly. So these impose a lot of requirements insofar as the infrastructure is concerned. So what you need to do is you need to analyze those requirements based on the type of patient that you want to cure and of course the disease that you want to cure and you want to end up by using the appropriate infrastructure. And the appropriate infrastructure maybe is a number of cloud services which are represented by another blueprint which is the technical blueprint. So this blueprint gives you the CPU performance requirements, the memory requirements, the networking requirements as you see here, the availability requirements, 24 times 7, because you need to have a network available all the time in order to cure the patient. And of course, the site-to-site -site connectivity options. Here you cannot uh, deal with networking solutions which are used for the classical internet. You need much more powerful networks and much more faster, of course, networks. And you want to use virtual private LAN services, for example, e-pipe networking, and all kinds of networking facilities which of course are very typical of the problem that you are facing and of the technical requirements that the problem is posing to you. And these of course are transferred as I mentioned to you uh, and recorded if you wish into a technical blueprint which gives you another part of the solution. So basically the idea is that you connect all these three blueprints that I gave to you and you have a complete, let's say, complete knowledge insofar as a particular patient uh, is concerned. You know about the stakeholders who are involved, you know about the resources, the technical resources, and you know about the processes. In other words, the technical, uh, if you wish, or not the technical, but the solutions, the medical solutions which you have to use in order to improve the health of a particular patient. So the, all these things are, let's say, associated, they are connected with each other and give you an entire picture about a particular patient, if you wish. And uh, incidentally, we were talking about uh, standards. And these are some of the standards that you have to use in the medical profession. Uh, so in this case, I, measure, um, um, uh, I mentioned a few uh, standards that uh, need to be used and uh, these standards, of course, are standards which are used uh, extensively throughout, uh, let's say, the medical domain. And in particular, uh, people know about the HIPA standards or the HL7 standards, which are very classical and they are used uh, throughout the world. But there's a, lo a heap of other standards that you have to take into account. And these standards need to be associated with the processes and the information that you, I provided to you before so that you are treating a patient in the right way, uh, under the right legal, let's say, context. And of course, uh, you are using, uh, let's say, standards which are used throughout the entire hospital system. So you cannot afford that each hospital has its own system and it's operating in isolation. If you do that, then of course, at the end of the day, nothing works. Okay, so I'm getting to the end of my uh, presentation slowly. Uh, these are, of course, technical requirements, and you have a number of, uh, let's say, business requirements which are not conveyed on those slides. But uh, what I'm trying to tell you here, or I'm trying to present here, is that you need a, an entire context for each of your patients in terms of the services that they are provided and they are uh, and you are using in order to treat and cure this patient. And these services have different dimensions, if you wish. They have technical dimensions, they have legal dimensions, they have resource dimensions, like I mentioned to you, uh, they have stakeholders, and they have segments, process segments, or if you wish, workflows, which tell you how to cure a particular, uh, let's say, patient. And this is what we call a holistic solution. In other words, you consider all this knowledge which exists, uh, let's say, quite isolated these days, and you try to integrate it and bring it into a central location in order to deliver a much better and, and much faster, of course, solution. So uh, let me uh, conclude with some remarks. Uh, and basically, these remarks are based on the fact that uh, uh, service-oriented computing is a vast area 
Uh, there's a lot of uh, problems which we haven't even thought about solving today. Uh, it's a very fertile ground for uh, doing research, and there's a lot of requirements uh, that people, unfortunately, these days don't consider. And one of the biggest problems that we are facing is people do not associate the business problems with the technical solutions. The other work in the area of business uh, services or in the area of technical services. One of the biggest, uh, let's say, uh, problems or barriers that we want to solve today is to somehow map the requirements of the business services down to the level of technical services and come up with appropriate infrastructure and appropriate solutions which deliver the right type of performance and of course the right type of quality of service. And I mentioned to you open problems in terms of at least uh, four areas. Uh, service foundation, service composition, service management and monitoring, and finally service-oriented engineering. Each of these areas is a fertile area of research. There's a lot of research that be, can be conducted there, starting from basic research, ranging all the way down to more applied and more application-oriented research. And uh, there's a lot of uh, conferences which are, uh, let's say, very active in the area of services today, which deal with a lot of aspects that I mentioned here. So finally, the last slide gives you some references uh, for your information. In case that uh, you're interested, I can provide you with more on online references or I can discuss individual, uh, let's say, open research problems with you during the break. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Michael, for a knowledgeable lecture on service-oriented computing and uh, as well as an example of, of the medical cloud. Any question from the floor, please raise your hand or you can come forward to the microphone. Well, thank you for very interesting talks. I'm very interested in the medical cloud part and especially the diabetes uh, medical treatment workflow. So the, I completely agree with your uh, vision and the idea, and I hope the, this vision comes, uh, is, will be implemented in the, also the, in Japan. But the, when I talk with a medical doctor and there's some hospital, the, they have the local constraint to handle the patients. So the rural, uh, small hospital and the big hospital in the city and the, the university hospital has a different constraint. So the, how do you think the, this kind of the standardization of the medical treatment workflow works well in the future? How we can... That's a very interesting question. Thank you for your kind remarks. Um, if you look at these workflows uh, in the medical profession, they're called medical pathways, and they're very well defined. So whichever hospital you're going to, to go to, they're going to treat diabetes in the same way. So they're not going to change. Maybe there is a slight difference insofar as the timing is concerned and the temporal issues, or maybe some hospitals use a faster approach or whatever. Now, the philosophy behind these types of medical networks, if you wish, is exactly what you mentioned. Resources are scarce. Uh, we're, we're facing a lot of financial problems. Is how do we optimize the use of our resources? How do we share our resources? So we have a small hospital next to a big one, right? Where do we send our patients? Do we send him to the small? Do we send him to the big? And why? And who is the doctor who is going to, let's say, operate? And under which circumstances and so on? So the idea is if I move information from one hospital to another hospital insofar as the patient is concerned, maybe I can give him a better, or her, a better, let's say, uh, solution, right? I may cure the uh, symptoms of their disease, for example, or may uh, operate them much faster, simply because what I'm doing now is I have if you wish something which we call global visibility. So basically what we had in the past is we had visibility on some of the aspects of, say, the patient. We didn't have a global picture. So here what we want to do is we want to have a global picture about the patient, and we also want to associate the patient with those medical pathways, which are the workflows. 
Uh, so I use the word workflow because computer scientists and people from business understand workflows. In reality, medicine, they don't understand workflows. They call them pen medical pathways. But uh, fortunately for service engineers like myself, medical pathways is something which I, I didn't understand until very recently. Now, uh, these things need to be very well defined. They need to be very well precise, and they need to be anchored in a number of those standards which are mentioned there, and there's a lot of standards which I didn't mention in this slide. So the, uh, the, the entire framework, if you wish, the environment is enormous. However, um, it requires a lot of discussion, and it requires a lot of effort from, let's say, engineering the solution during the design, uh, let's say, of the solution. We mentioned uh, during, the, uh, let's say, this morning's conversations that design is something which is very important for the services. So basically, the first 10 here is design. You need to do the right type of design. You need to organize your services in the right way. You need to describe them in the right way so that other organizations, hospitals, uh, let's say, um, uh, laboratories, what have you, can understand them, and then you can start integrating them. So this is a long process. It's not something that we can create tomorrow. So it's a five-year sort of plan. Uh, of course, we want to get uh, funding for it, and we aim for a three-year window. So in many respects, we're going to, uh, I suppose, put a lot of uh, problems under the mm -hmm. carpet if we get funding for that. But uh, nevertheless, uh, for us, it's important to understand, uh, uh, let's say, how we can deliver, let's say, pragmatic solutions by using, let's say, automated services and, of course, using exceedingly cloud resources rather than uh, demanding that an, a hospital has all the computing, let's say, facilities and resources up front. This is, in some cases, almost impossible. So the resources that I mentioned to you in the previous slide may come from another hospital, which is hundreds of kilometers away. It makes a difference. As long as, as I have uh, these machines available and all this information available, then, of course, I can reuse it in a completely different uh, var geographic environment. I, I, may, I completely understand the your vision, very beautiful and the I'm very impressed with that. Can I add one? So the, Absolutely. In the service-oriented architecture, you mentioned about the person. So the, in case of the uh, medical crowd, so the, we can increase the throughput and the, some financial constraint. We can easily so maybe quickly solve the financial constraint, but the person constraint human resource constraint, we really have a problem to solve Absolutely. the, so the, do you have any idea Absolutely, this? yeah, this is, this, is, this is a matter of coordination, so we're talking about all kinds of clever algorithms, so basically uh, you're treating doctors and nurses as resources, you need to find out about their availability, about their shifts, of course, uh, you know, what other, uh, let's say, uh, for example, uh, requirements they may have on their schedule, daily schedule, for example, commitments and so on, so that you can book their time. So basically, if you assume that the doctor is, let's say, free to do an operation, and this doctor is not available, then you're not achieving very much. So basically, uh, it's an optimization problem. So you need to optimize your resources. And there you need more clever algorithms. You need much better machine learning, uh, let's say, techniques and all that stuff, which comes into play. So it's a very complex, uh, let's say, and I'm afraid I don't have any solutions <laughs> If you have any solutions, then of course I'm very happy to discuss that with you. Yes. Well, I'd like to just to add on the, on the diabetes case. Um, uh, how, how do you deal for disruptive innovation, like um, if we have um, blood sugar sensors which can inject insulin directly or, or automatically? And, uh, is that easy to build in, or does it mean re, re, remodeling no, in some basically way? What, what you do, uh, basically, what you do have is, is you have these sensors embedded on the patient, and they uh, broadcast uh, the information in real time. This information is picked up by the network, is getting analyzed, and if, of course, there is an emergency situation, then, of course, they go and pick up uh, the patient, and they bring him to the operating theater, for example. So basically, there's a lot of devices, which I uh, conveniently forgot to mention here. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, and, and these are, uh, let's say, automated services again, they're embedded services. So basically these services are also part of the cloud services or the business services, if you wish. It's the same thing like with, uh, let's say, uh, traffic services, right? So basically you have all kinds of services which are embedded in, uh, let's say, the uh, navigator systems, the car navigator systems. These are being transmitted, so you know your route, uh, you go faster, uh, you know uh, which is the closest hospital, and these are also part of the solution. I didn't mention those, but of course they are very important and they are part of the solution as well. So bringing, for example, the patient, uh, like uh, um, we were discussing before, to the closest, uh, let's say, hospital may not be the optimal solution because maybe the doctors are not available to treat this particular patient. So we need to know which is the next nearest hospital and try to optimize the resources so that we can treat this particular patient. So this is part of the entire ecosystem. So everything should be connected to everything, ideally. Uh, not that it happens in practice, of course. <laughs> Any more questions? No more fe questions from the floor. Thank you very much, Professor you. Michael, Papa Sokru, for the special lectures today.